Good afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Madhav Rajan. I'm the uh, Dean and the George Schultz Professor of Accounting at Chicago Booth. Uh, to all of you watching from around the globe, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Um, I'm thrilled that you could be here as we welcome Peter May, the President and Founding part, uh, Partner of Trian Partners, Chicago Booth alum, uh, and the College at UChicago to our Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, as you all know, this is a long-standing Chicago Booth tradition. And the goal is to bring in high profile leaders from business, from the government, from the community to the school to share their insights and experience. So this used to be an event we did in person way, way back when the pandemic began about two and a half years ago, uh, we moved to a virtual model uh, to essentially ask our alumni about how COVID was going, how their companies and organizations were reacting to it. So we had a lot of interesting conversations with uh, a wide variety of people, Tom Ricketts of the Cubs, Jenny Scanlon from UL, uh, JP Gan from Inns Capital, Jose Antonio Alvarez, Chairman of Santander, and so on. Um, and a few weeks ago, we had a terrific chat with Jason Wright, uh, who's uh, the president of the Washington Commanders NFL team. Um, we're really, really thrilled today to have uh, a very, very distinguished guest in Peter May. So Peter, as I said, is president and a founding partner of Trian Fund Management. And Trian invests in underperforming, undervalued public companies, looks to work with management and the board to create lasting value. So right now, Peter is serving as the non-executive senior vice chairman of Wendy's. Um, and before that, he served as Wendy's non-executive vice chairman from 2007 to 2021. Uh, he's also served as a director of Tiffany from uh, 2008 through 2017. Uh, from 1993 to 2007, he was president, COO, and a director of Triarch. Uh, which at that time owned Arby's and the Snapple Beverage Group, as well as many other consumer and, uh, and industrial businesses. Uh, before that, from 83 to 88, Peter was uh, president and CEO and the director of Triangle Industries, a largest packaging company in the world and a Fortune 100 industrial company, which was then acquired by uh, Pechine, leading international metals and packaging company. In addition to his uh, day job, uh, Peter has, does an incredible work, uh, amount for the community, uh, he's Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Trustees for Mount Sinai, uh, where he has led this incredible turnaround to, of this academic health center to become what's one of the most profitable and fastest growing academic medical centers in the United States. He's co-chair of the New York Philharmonic, uh, director of the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, trustee of the New York Historical Society. It's and enough. enough? All right. <laughs> so... I'm going to stop there, and uh, I may bring these things up, though. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So let's go back a little bit in your career, and, and I'll come to the booth part in a minute. Could you just say a bit about what led you and your partners to found Trian back in 2005? So actually, um, if, you if you go way back, um, yeah. some of the companies you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, I started my career in public accounting. I graduated from what was GSB at the University of Chicago. It wasn't Booth yet. David was younger than me. Um, and um, uh, majored in accounting and uh, started my career at uh, what's now KPMG. It was Pete Mowick Mitchell at the time. Um, with the idea that I wanted to learn about business, that uh, accounting, you know, investment banking in those days was a tiny industry. Um, not a lot of opportunity. And accounting was one of the best ways of really learning the language of business. And um, so I, I did that from a professional point of view for a number of years when I was told I was going to be a partner. Um, then I decided it was time for me to really do something that I wanted to do, which was to be involved in the operating side of a business. And I joined one of my clients, uh, Nelson Peltz, who had a small family food business. And together we built that business into the largest food service distributor in the Northeast. Um, we then um, started raising capital and um, ultimately took control of a small public company called Triangle Industries, um, used that as a vehicle to buy National Can, then acquired American Can, merged them together um, and created the largest packaging company in the world. And the philosophy uh, and um, 
And then in the, that was in the eighties and the nineties, we sold that company to Pechene. Um, it was, uh, we invested $13 million when we bought Triangle Industries, um, we built, as I said, we built it to the largest packaging company in the world and sold it for 4.2 billion. Um, our 13 million was just shy of a billion, which was a good IRR. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then in the 90s, we bought, took control of a small public company, um, which we named Triarch. It was originally controlled by Victor Posner, who was a very bad corporate actor. It was the name of the company was DWG. It was called Dog on Wall Street, uh, and uh, appropriately so. But it it and it had a lot of junky businesses. But it also owned RC Cola and um, and and Arby's. And so we sold all the businesses that we didn't think had value um, or that we could build. And um, RC Cola led us to buying Snapple. Um, uh, which became a great success. Quaker Oats had bought it, paid a billion eight for it, um, and started to really ignore what was unique about Snapple. Um, they ended up starting to lose money, and we ended up buying it from them for three hundred million dollars. Turned it back around by bringing in the right management and um, uh, sold it to Cadbury Schweppes for a billion five. So another good IRR. Um, and up to that point, all of the investments we made were with our own money. And what our whole philosophy has been is to invest in companies that we think are good companies that are either poorly managed, undermanaged, not recognizing the opportunities um, or having a, what we call a wide angle lens in terms of where their business can go and not really thinking about businesses from a long-term or from, um, uh, for, as an, uh, from an entrepreneurial approach. And that's sort of the way we, what we bring to the party. So in 2005, we decided that there were huge opportunities in much bigger companies and that we, you know, our resources were limited to our own funds up to that point. And that's when we started trying partners and started to take in outside money. And, um, you know, we had a very good track record in terms of what we had built. So we were able to attract a fair amount of outside capital. And today we have close to $8 billion under management. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, for those uh, participating, feel free to send in questions through q and I have a bunch of questions people sent in advance, Peter, but uh, and I'll also curate questions as they come in. So please feel sure. free. Uh, so you spoke about finding companies that you can then uh, work with and turn around. And you're frequently referred to as an engaged shareholder. So what does that mean in your view? How do you find these opportunities? Are they welcoming when you uh, come into these situations? Well, so, you know, we got lumped into a category called activists. Um, and, um, you know, we were always, as I described it very briefly in, in, um, in what was 30 years of investing, um, we were always trying to work very closely with management to motivate them, give them the tools, help them raise capital, think about their businesses, as I said, as entrepreneurs, and, um, and build those businesses. Um, when we started to take in outside capital and go after bigger companies, um, then we were starting to essentially be, be looked at as, threat, as threats because we were you know, taking a position in a larger company and um, where we felt management wasn't doing a great job. And so we, we got labeled with corporate raiders, activists, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and over time, as we became more and more successful um, and started to really get the reputation of working collegially with board, with board members, um, the, the concept of engaged shareholder. Actually, it was um, uh, it was Larry Frank of BlackRock who gave us that who gave us that name. But um, but we were always engaged. Now you know our first our first um, with Tryon Partners, um, uh, our, our, we ended up with a with a proxy fight with an investment in H.J. Hines because um, you know we built a, a decent stake in the company through the fund. And um, 
uh, went to the management and said that we thought that they were, you know, they had one of the worst uh, shareholder return records, TSRs, um, for many years. They had continued to see sales stagnate, um, and they spent less than 2% on marketing in a consumer products business. And we went to them and said, you know, you really have to invest in the company and you've got to invest in your products. And of course, their initial reaction was, who are you guys? You have no right to tell us what to do. And we had a proxy contest and we ended up getting, um, winning that contest, getting three seats on the board. Um, and then basically had to win over the board and management because they, you know, thought we were interlopers. But, you know, we basically said, we're here to help. We're here. We're, we're you know, we have a big stake in the company. And one of the things that's very interesting is when you make an investment like that, and when you go on the board of a company like, like Heinz or several of the others over the time that, that we've been on, um, most of the board members are not um, large shareholders. Most of them are friends of the CEO or, you know, have been, um, have been selected for a whole host of reasons based upon things they bring in terms of their experience or diversity, et cetera. But none of them, most often, they don't have a stake in the company um, other than the shares that they got by, from stock options as their compensation on the board. And we come and we, you know, with anywhere from one to two to 5%, in the case of, uh, of um, Heinz, I think we had um, uh, five or 6% of the stock. And so we have a billion and a half dollars invested and are, we're totally aligned with the shareholder point of view. But at the same time, we don't come in and start accusing people of doing things stupidly. We come in and say, we're here to work. We're here to help you. And um, we've developed a reputation over time that we're quite collegial. Now we've had a couple of other proxy contests, but um, um, we had one with Procter & Gamble a few years ago, um, which was an enormous company that, you know, um, and, and a great company. But we've, you know, again, we felt that they, they were organized in a very complex way that no one was held accountable for, um, for the bottom line of any of their individual businesses. And um, we ended up, you know, with the proxy contest that went on for a while. And ultimately, the large institutional shareholders basically went to management. We only asked for one board seat, you know, and when you ask for one board seat, you're basically you know, you have no influence except that you can convince people that your point of view makes sense. So um, we thought it was ridiculous that they were fighting us in the first place, but they fought us simply because, you know, they were Procter and Gamble and how dare somebody ask to be on their board instead of being invited to on their board. Um, and it turned out that the law, a few large institutional shareholders finally said, okay, you got to, you know, what harm is it going to be? And so we ended up on the board and ended up being very friendly. Nelson went on that board. We ended up being very friendly with the management team. They listened to what we had to say about, uh, about their organization structure. We convinced them to bring McKinsey in and help redesign the organization and get rid of a so-called matrix, which to us is one of the worst organization structures because nobody's accountable for anything. Um, and they reorganized and the company has done incredibly well since then. And since, you know, Nelson then went off the board, we've sold our stock. And, you know, there are dozens of examples like that. And, you know, so the concept of engaged shareholders is exactly what we are. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of factual questions. One question came in, are your investments in the US only? If so, why would you ever consider doing stuff outside the US? So our investments have not only been in the US, um, we were significant investors in Cadbury Schweppes um, in the UK. Um, just to take a step back before I give some examples, we will invest in a jurisdiction where we really understand what the laws are and what the, um, you know, where you can have influence. Um, you know, there are a number of jurisdictions where no matter, you know, how much stock you have, the the structural, either governmental or board structures are such that you can't have any influence. But um, we had an investment in um, 
in, in Cadbury Schweppes, where we felt that um, the company was both in the confectionery business and the beverage business, that they were using the cash flow from the beverage business um, to, to basically support the, 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 the um, confectionery business and didn't really um, invest properly. Um, we felt that that company would be better um, separating the two, the two businesses. We also had at the same time an investment in Kraft in the US. And at that time, Kraft, this is, this is in, I guess, the 2012, something like that. At that time, Kraft um, was a big conglomerate and um, was not growing very well. And um, we felt that they needed to expand, um, expand their um, snacking business because the Kraft at the time was both their grocery business, which was the cheese and Maxwell House coffee and products like that, as well as Nabisco um, and um, the Oreo brands. And so um, we had our position in Cadbury. We then said to Kraft, you ought to buy Cadbury, and, um, which they did. We were very happy with that. And then we went back to Kraft and said, OK, now you should separate the company into two companies, one a grocery business and one a confectionery and snacking business. And they ultimately created Mondelez, which I ultimately went on the board. Um, Mondelez, by the way, the only thing they did wrong was to name it. <laughs> <laughs> we used to say that, it's, that the name sounded like a disease. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, what's ironic is here's a company that has the brands of Cadbury, Milka, Oreo, Ritz crackers, Nabisco, um, all the, all these great brands and, you know, it should have been Oreo brands or something like that or, or, or whatever. And instead they probably spent a hundred million dollars with some consultant to come up with the name Mondelez, which supposedly Monda for world and Belize for delicious, but you know, every time, you know, I served on the board for about seven years. And every time I said I'm on the board of Mondelez, people would say, who's that? <laughs> you got you, you're, you're in Chicago. So you, it's a big yes. presence in Chicago. So you know that. And they're finally, the world is starting to understand the name. But that's an example of just, you know, listening to consultants that don't make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> it turned out, turned out to be a great company. And then, of course, Heinz, Heinz got bought by... Um, uh, by uh, the Brazilians, um, and um, and then they then they bought um, they used Heinz to buy the rest of Kraft. Hmm. That's now Kraft Heinz, which has they haven't done that great with. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other factual questions: Just how did you make or raise sufficient capital to make your first investment? What was your track record good enough? Was raising money easy, hard? Raising money is never easy. Raising money requires a lot of legwork, a lot of travel, a lot of communications. But we had a very good we had a very good track record in our private investments, as I described a little bit earlier, um, and over time started to develop uh, relationships with big shareholders um, and institutions. Um, but you know, initially our first raise, um, we we actually worked with Goldman Sachs in their um, uh, in, in one of their divisions to help us raise money. And interestingly, when we started out, we were considered kind of it was very a hybrid that no one could really understand what our structure was. Mm. So we wanted to have a similar structure to a um, a private equity firm, which would be a drawdown fund. And then when we found a target, you know, raise the money and then we found the target, draw the funds down. Mm -hmm. But at the time, because we were investing in public companies rather than investing in private companies, we were either a hedge fund or, you know, even the, the, the term in 2005 was, you know, you were a hedge fund or you were, you know, a private equity fund. Or you were a long only fund, but so we had to start out taking all the capital um, and um, and then putting it to work, which initially put a little bit of a drag on our returns, 
because we you know weren't going to rush into in, into investing um and initially i think our first rate in, our, i think our in thinking back our initial um capitalization was about a billion and a half dollars and we put nelson and i put a fair amount of our own capital in uh, to start out um and then we started to develop a reputation and um, uh, moved from uh, smaller family office kinds of um, uh, uh, investors to large institutional investors. And today, the bulk of our, um, our investors are either sovereign wealth funds or large pension funds um, because they like, you know, we've, we've created a category. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit, Peter, about how do you find these companies? I mean, clearly, you it must take a lot of effort to figure out who you want to go after and what you feel you can achieve with that. What's sort of the process that you go through to find that? Sure. Well, first of all, we're very concentrated. So we typically don't have more than six or seven or eight, maybe at the most, individual investments um, because we want to have large stakes so that we want to be able to have influence. And it also takes a lot of time you know, on each individual name. Um, so we have organized our, our firm um, with essentially three different categories of, um, of targets. One is anything consumer, which would be consumer products, restaurants, um, consumer services. Um, one is um, industrial companies. Um, and the third is financial services, but financial services that don't have, uh, that, that are less regulated. They're all, they're regulated, but not, we wouldn't go after a bank or an insurance company. Mm -hmm. Um, although we did have an investment in both state street and bank of New York, but they were primarily service businesses as opposed to, um, as opposed to lending institutions. Um, and. And our, and our firm is organized, although everybody gets to know what's going on in every investment. We have specialists who focus on each of those silos. And because the scale of the companies that we invest in are typically um, from 10 to $15 billion market cap up to, you know, P&G and GE, you know, we're huge companies. Um, and that, and Unilever, which is where we're in, we're in right now. Um, uh, so um, we tend to know every company in that's public and is in a market where it's friendly enough that we can, you know, invest. Uh, Unilever is also in the UK uh, headquartered, um, and so you know we're constantly we're probably following fifty or sixty companies at any one time. And understanding where they, what they're doing, and what issues they have, and then you have to kind of, you you can find something where you really think there are things that need to be changed, but the stock price they may that might not have yet been reflected in the stock price. So you're always watching to measure when the right time to enter is. Mm -hmm. And do you have going in some notion of how long you're? want to keep it or are you open to keeping it for very very long periods so we you know we don't have a specific time frame but our history has been that our average hold for companies where we've gone on the board which is the bulk of them mm -hmm. um, is probably five and a half six years you know we we, we and and we're, we consider ourselves long-term investors we want to you know we, we're you know, we're reevaluating our portfolio all the time and looking at, you know, every, you know, twice a week, we have a formal investment team mm -hmm. lunch. And we, you know, part of the time we're talking about new ideas and part of the time we're talking about what's happening in our existing investments. And, you know, you constantly look at what, what the company is doing and what the upside is from where it is. And, you know, has it realized its potential and should we be moving on? Or is there a lot more, you know, so we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that came in earlier was, has the, how has the expansion of private equity as an institutional asset class, has that affected your practices or of other so-called activist investors? Well, it's interesting, a number of the active, I, I, I would say we always, we consider ourselves a hybrid of private equity. Mm -hmm. 
because we take sizable positions. I mean, you know, they range from 1% of, 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 of Unilever to 25% of Wendy's. And, you know, Wendy's is, is a small company. So, um, but, you know, so we're, we're, we think of ourselves as kind of a derivative of private equity because what we do is very similar to what they do. But, you know, we've kind of, the old myth was that you can't fix a company in while it's in the public eye. Mm. And, you know, I think we've proven that that's not correct. Uh, um, so, so to a certain degree, we think of ourselves as private equity, but I also think that, um, you know, we're moving towards having larger positions in companies and, you know, looking at perhaps taking some of them private on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have operated in that context in the past, you know, the, the earlier companies that I described, uh, Snapple, we owned 100%, American National Cam, we owned 100% through public vehicles, but still, um, still we owned 100% of the company. So, um, I think that, you know, the, the value of private equity to the investing public, and here's an interesting distinction, is that the investors, particularly the large institutions, like the fact that companies are private because they don't have to have a public mark all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a mark that's, that's done by, the, you know, a ho hopefully good analysis but it's, it, it, they're not measured. So the investor themselves, um, the portfolio manager who made the investment is not measured every day by, by mm -hmm. the stock performance. Um, so, you know, that's a downside of our model for some investors. Having said that, the upside is the liquidity mm -hmm. of the investment. So, um, you know, we don't, although we do have a number of our funds that have three year, five year, and we just recently raised a fund to focus specifically on asset management, um, where we're today the largest shareholder of Janice Henderson and uh, second largest shareholder of Invesco. And um, those we have as much as a 10 year lockup. So it's, it's more like private equity. Mm -hmm. And then you have funds like Elliott that have gone you know, into private equity as well as um, doing what we do. Hmm. So we have a couple of questions, Peter, about how do you structure deals uh, in general and in light of the current financing market? So question was, how, how has the investment team quote gotten creative in order to deploy capital without debt financing? Well, we've never used debt financing in our fund. I mean, our fund is pure equity and our investors are giving us, you know, they're, they're making an equity investment in the fund. Um, and we don't use leverage, you know, we, we may have a very modest amount of leverage, you know, through, um, uh, you know, against our positions, but, you know, it's never more than 15 or 20% of the book. Um, uh, the issue, it becomes where, what, what do our portfolio companies, how do they, how do they grow mm -hmm. in the context of, um, of current, uh, you know, of, of the financing markets. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, Nelson and I go back to um, our first deal when we bought National Can in 1985. We made our investment in National Can in 1985. Um, we paid 15% for junk bonds. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, now multiples were lower at that time, but still, you know, and we managed to take $130 million of costs out by combining American and National Can together. And we fin kept on financing the company with very expensive debt. So, you know, you have to really understand the liquidity profile of the business and the cash flow profiles. Um, but, you know, we're, we're pretty comfortable um, working through um, different credit markets. And I would say that what's interesting is a lot of people got so used to incredibly low interest rates mm -hmm. that they got somewhat sloppy in how they evaluated businesses. I mean, if, and, and um, you know, and the recent volatility that we have and what's happened to the market in, in you know, this year, of course, the, the last six weeks have been certainly a lot better. But 
um, it's been a rude awakening for an awful lot of young people who say, oh my God, you know, interest rates are now 6%, you know, and, um, you know, I remember when we were building our, our first business, the, the, the food service business, prime rate, which doesn't exist anymore, was 21%. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, and, and, and you didn't borrow at prime, you borrowed at three over prime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're paying 2% a month. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sticking to the current environment, Peter, just uh, what a questions came in about what areas are you focusing on? What are the, where, where do you see the investment opportunities? Well, I think, you know, the fact, you know, um, the fact that the market is volatile and, and, people are nervous creates opportunities. Um, and again, as I said before, we follow a lot of companies and a number of them have started to come into a, a financial range that, um, that, we, that we like. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you also have to look at, you know, is this period of inflation gonna, how long is it gonna last? And none of us can, a good mm -hmm. but, you know, don't, none of us have a crystal ball, but, you know, um, you know, if you can't automatically say, well, everything's cheap because the multiples can change when, um, you know, it, when, when things get to be uh, more difficult, when interest rates continue to go up and, and with the inflation. Um, I do think, you know, personally, um, the companies that we've invested in are all doing a lot better than the world thinks they are. Um, you know, there are constant surprises every time people are reporting earnings. And I think the big difference is that although there's inflation, there's also the, the, the unemployment levels are unique. I mean, you know, everybody talks about we're going to have a huge recession. And then I've never seen a recession where you have three and a half percent unemployment. I mean, you know, and I think that once we get it, when inflation starts to level off and it's got to because the Fed's been, you know, they were late, but they certainly have been pretty active um, now. And, you know, the first thing that's been affected dramatically is the housing market. Mm -hmm. And that starts, you know, those things. And now you're seeing big layoffs from um, in the tech world. Now, they don't have huge amounts of employees, but. You know, it'll happen in the financial services industries too, and probably, you know, some of the other businesses. So I think that, you know, labor, I think what's going to, what you're going to see is a slowing of inflation. Um, wages are not going to go down. Hmm. You know, they may level off, but they're not going to go down. And if you have inflation come down, um, it may not come down to 2%, but if it comes down a lot lower than where it is today and the wage rates stay up, then the consumer has a lot more money. And the consumer is 70% of our economy. So I'm fairly bullish on what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the next few years. Okay, that's great. Um, switching uh, just a little bit, one of the questions that came in was, you obviously see and evaluate talent a lot, right? That's one of the prime things you do. Have leadership styles sort of changed over time? Are there differences between what it takes, you know, at a small business versus a large corporate? Well, that's an interesting, it's, it's very interesting. At the end of the day, what makes a business, an enterprise, an organization, anything, a, a university successful is talent and, 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 the, um, and, and the quality of management. Um, and so... Uh, a lot of what we've seen over time is people get to the C-suite being partially political and, um, uh, and trying to influence the right people who are making decisions, the board, whatever, um, and don't necessarily, you know, surround themselves with the best and the brightest because they want to be the leader. And those, those CEOs or those managers are probably long-term the worst. Um, to me, what we look for in a company, and we've done a lot of, you know, over time, not, we don't come into a business and say, we got to change the CEO. Once in a while, we know right away that's going to happen. 
but um, it's over time we've been an instrumental in a lot of changes in management. And one of the things that we look for, there are two things. One is we want management to think about themselves as if they owned 100% of the business. We always say to them, you know, if you owned 100% of this company, would you make that investment? Would you organize the way you have organized? Um, and if they say no, then we know that, 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 then that that's not the right answer. Um, we want them to have a long-term horizon and make an investment in the business that is going to have, you know, you take risk and you, you do what you have to do. You know, you do your homework to make sure you're, you've evaluated the decisions properly, but you don't do it based upon meeting quarterly guidance. Hmm. You know, and that's one of the things that I think has been a really bad thing that's happened over the last that we've seen over the last 30 years that you know people have guidance and then they come up with guidance and they tell the world what they expect to do and then if, if it gets close to the end of a quarter and they're not going to meet the numbers they do some stupid things to try to make the numbers that can long term hurt the company mm -hmm. you know going back to the investment in Heinz that was a that was exactly what happened you know, they kept one of the things you can cut that affects your co co current PL is marketing costs that mm -hmm. gets booked in the quarter in the period that you're that you're spending it. So if the CFO comes into the CEO and says, you know, we're going to be five cents short this quarter, they say, okay, don't spend the money on Heinz ketchup this quarter. And you do that one quarter, it's okay. You do it the second quarter and you, you, you find yourself behind the eight ball. That's how they got the, to the point of spending 2% on marketing when it should have been seven or eight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it's a long-winded answer to um, management, but, but we look for people who really have confidence in themselves and want to surround themselves with the best and the brightest. We, we typically say, you know, try to hire somebody who wants your job. Because that person is going to be the is going to help you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a threat to you. Mm -hmm. uh, question came in: How often does it happen that after an investment is made, you realize that the problem isn't fixable, or sort of you know, have you made investments that you didn't work out, or sort of do you do post mortems on them? We well, I, you know, obviously, what typically happened. I have to say that we've never made an investment that was you know was impossible to where we had great shock about major things that we didn't know about there are always surprises um sometimes you end up doing things differently than you originally thought you were going to do but um uh, but the opportunities are still there to improve the business um, we've had some situations where the macro environment created problems for us back in 2000 and, and eight, when the world was coming to an end, we had invested in a, um, in a, in a chemical company um, where we, we saw a great opportunity for rationalizing their operations. 80% of their business was from 20% of their, of, of their plants. And we thought they really needed a lot of rationalization of their businesses. Um, uh, the problem in that case, when when 2009 hit and the banks weren't lending money, com this company had uh, a debt that was coming due. We knew it was coming due. They had a revolver that was going to allow them to support it. Um, and um, it turned out that the banks did everything they could to not fund the revolvers at that time. It was a very unique, you know, macro situation. But, you know, that one was... You know, we ended up, that company ended up going into bankruptcy. So that was a loss for us. It, um, uh, but otherwise, you know, we do a lot of homework. I mean, we can be doing due diligence for a year on a company before mm. we pull the trigger. Mm. Uh, so we really have not had, you know, major mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, switching topics again a bit. One topic you're very passionate about is ESG. Could you speak about your thoughts on it? How does try and try to influence companies on ESG type issues? Sure. So ESG is really, you know, um, it's interesting how it's become, you know, the, the topic du jour. Um, 
But it's an area that we've always looked at. I mean, first of all, start with the G, which is governance. And that's where we started out by, you know, looking at getting in, getting um, onto a board and, and making sure that the board was functioning appropriately and holding management accountable. Um, so governance has always been something, I mean, that's, that's really where we started as, as uh, but the other parts, social responsibility and the environment um, are things that we always paid attention to, not necessarily from the perspective of the way, you know, BlackRock and some of the other investors look at it, but from the business perspective, because over time, what, you've, what we've all seen is that the consumer, particularly the younger consumer, is very interested in the footprint of the companies that they use, whether it's a service company, whether it's a, a products company, they want to know if they're buying a product, they want to know how it's sourced, they want to know what the ingredients are, they want to know what the um, what environmental footprint you have, that company has. And, um, and it's really important in today's world for companies to be very responsive to that. It's, it's good business, it's good for society. Um, and so it's an area that we're always, we, we try to get, when we get onto a board, we try to get onto, the, each company has a different, area that whether you know that that monitors um or that the board um, works on sometimes it's done through the audit committee sometimes it's done through a formal esg committee sometimes it's the it's the um uh, compensation committee one of the things that we try to do in almost every company where we invest in where we're on the board is get on the compensation committee hmm. One of the ways that you have influence over ESG is um, to, to have part of a compensation structure include certain KPIs, you know, uh, uh, key product, key, key performance indicators um, that are tied to the appropriate ESG goals that fit that particular company. You know, in the case of Mondelez, in the case of Wendy's, uh, one of the big areas, Mondelez was both a, a, a use of power um, and, and um, packaging. Packaging at Wendy's is, is a huge issue in terms of um, power is not a big issue, but, but packaging is. And we've, you know, been very influential in the company shifting. They just went to a clear plastic cup that's totally uh, biodegradable. At Mondelez, uh, the, the company publicly said that by 2025, um, 100% of their packaging would be recyclable. Um, so uh, go do, working through the comp committee is a very effective way to do it. Um, but I've also found that it's most managements recognize that it's important from a business point of view, mm. that the consumer or their customer wants to know where they sit. And then diversity, the third big area. Um, again, you, your consumer is a diverse population and they want to, people want to make sure that, that the companies they're buying from have, um, have, a, have, a, have a management team and an, an employee base that looks like they are. Mm -hmm. um, let me throw out a qu question that came in sort of a bit outside what you do, but the question was, should hedge funds be involved in human services such as nursing homes and hospitals? It, well, that, I don't, it, it, that, that's a, should they be involved in the meaning, should they try to be, have it as an investment or try to have an influence over them to operate? I would say the latter. Yeah, um, you know, um, well, I've spent a lot of my time in the not-for-profit sector, and obviously, and actually, I got involved as, as in Mount Sinai because it was in financial difficulty, and they knew our part of my skill set was in helping turn around uh, businesses, um, and obviously, the impact of a of a large hospital system is very important from a public policy point of view. 
So I think that, you know, that's, it, that it's appropriate. Um, it's appropriate for all of us, you know, once you, you know, to, to give a certain amount of our, our time to, to um, uh, public uh, and, or philanthropic endeavors. I don't see, you know, you know, you could, if there's a nursing home chain that's poorly run, um, then it can be an appropriate target for, um, for an active investment. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think you want to, you know, you're not, uh, it, you don't want to mix the two. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about philanthropy. So let me sort of uh, talk about Chicago, uh, the university. Maybe just go back to a little bit to your time at Booth. What was it like? Uh, how did that help you in your career as you went through it? Well, so I went to both the college and, and mm -hmm. business yeah. school, and I was in a program which I still think was one of the great programs. It was called professional options. So you could be in the college for three years and then take and then go to the business school or the law school um, for the last for to get the to get your MBA or your LLB. So um, I got my bachelor's after my fourth in my first year of business school um, and I thought that was a great program it was also you know in the 60s when the Vietnam War was around and uh, I was not anxious to, uh, to 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 have to go to Vietnam but it was also you know I think um, uh, I think the opportunity to learn about business you know, I used to say I loved what I loved the University of Chicago. It was an amazing place. The college was was a great experience, but you don't really learn how to make a living there unless you want to teach, um, and then you have to figure out what you do next. Um, but when I when I look back at my days there, so I was an accounting major, um, and um, Sidney Davidson was uh, mm -hmm. was there, and. Um, and it was a great time. George Stigler was there. Milton Friedman was there. Um, uh, my years at Chicago were incredible. I mean, I always say that what I learned in, in the college was how to read and how to write and how to think. Mm -hmm. And what I learned in, in, in what's now Booth was how to apply those, you know, those skill sets to um, learn analysis and to understand, you know, how I was going to use them in my career. Um, so I have had, you know, I, I have nothing but the greatest admiration to, to my experience. And then fortunately I went on, you know, I was served on the board of trustees of the university mm -hmm. for almost 30 years. And um, that was a great experience as well. So, so related to that and the other things you've done, could you say a little bit about philanthropy and why is that important to you? You've invested an incredible amount, both not just monetarily, but your time. And what drives you to do that, Peter? Well, so, you know, I, I came from a family that was, um, that was in a position to give back. I mean, not a wealthy family, but one that was comfortable enough that, um, you know, set a good example about, giving back. Um, and so I, from the, you know, I always felt that it was very important, but I have a very specific philosophy of, of philanthropy and I call it engaged philanthropy because it's, you know, you get to a certain point in your career or in your, in your financial um, success where it's relatively easy to write a check, but it is what really makes the difference being um, involved in philanthropy is not only writing a check, but rolling up your sleeves and getting involved in the organization. Um, it, you know, as I said, you know, lots of people like to join the board of a museum or, a, you know, or, or something that's chic because it's socially interesting and they'll give the money that's necessary to do that. Um, that's not the way I approach philanthropy. I approach it on the basis of I want to number one understand the institution and understand whether it's something that I really want to get involved in, and then I do want to get involved. And you know, my years on the board of the University of Chicago um, were terrific. And I ended, I was on the executive committee for a number of years and was very much involved in campus planning and in a number of the in in, in a number of our capital campaigns. Um, and as I said at, at Mount Sinai, I you know was there for 17 years as chairman, that's probably too long. Um, 
but we ended up taking a, a very good community hospital and making it the largest healthcare system in New York City and having the medical school move from number 40 to number six in NIH grants. So it, it was an extremely rewarding um, endeavor for me. And now I'm on, I'm co-chairman of the New York Philharmonic and we just opened our new, uh, just our totally redone concert hall. And I was very involved in that because mm -hmm. one of my personal interests is architecture. And I was very involved in the redesign of the hall, which has been a great success. So I like to roll up my sleeves and get involved. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Uh, we had a question come in, uh, Peter, about what was your favorite class when you were an undergrad at U Chicago? Well, so Milton Friedman, I took a class, Milton Friedman had 12 kids in the class. Mm. And think about that. Um, that was amazing. And we, Hugo, uh, Hugo Bettelheim was te teaching sociology at the time. Um, it's hard to say which was my favorite. What was so interesting about Chicago, I would start out by saying that in the college, the core curriculum and humanities 101 was one of the most interesting because as I said, I learned how to read and I learned how to think, but we went to the Art Institute and we went to, I got my interest in classical music in Chicago, um, although my parents were interested in it as well. But um, so, so the, 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 the core curriculum, which, was a require which still is a requirement was a great way to kind of really learn about a lot of stuff that um, I had not been exposed to. I mean, I took a course on Stravinsky, you know, which <laughs> was kind of cool. Um, I didn't like physics, though I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, as you mentioned, you're in the talent business, right? Ultimately, uh, so one of the questions is sort of who saw your talent? Have you had mentors, people who helped you through your career? Um, well, I would say my biggest mentor was my father. Um, interestingly, my father was of the, the grew up in the depression, um, was the first person in his family to go to college. His father was a butcher and his father um, had, you know, could afford to send him to college, but he wanted my father to be a doctor and my father didn't want to be a doctor. So mm -hmm. he ended up working his way through school, went to NYU at night and worked during the day to put himself through school. And he set an example of, you know, uh, of, of, of how you have to really put the kind of work in to be successful. And his, the, the one thing he imparted to me was always do more than what's expected of you mm. in any job you're in or anything that you do. And that's been my mantra. And whenever I counsel young people about, you know, career stuff, it's, you know, set an example by, by rolling, by doing more than just what the job requires by really, you know, not being obnoxious, standing out to just say, hey, look at me, this is what I did, but just to do it. Mm. And you get recognized and um, you know I, I've been fortunate that people have recognized. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of students on and uh, one of them wanted to know what advice would you have for somebody who wants to build a career in investment management particularly in the public markets is that something you would still recommend to people that this is a field they should get into? Well sure I mean you know uh, it, there's no question that investment management is a huge industry and um, I mean, one of, as I said, we have a fund where we're um, in doing a bit of a roll up in, in the industry because we think that there are probably too many small firms and a lot of, a lot of um, costs that are, you know, that, that are wasted. But in general, you know, it's a fascinating industry, but first you have to have a passion for what you're investing in. So in other words, you know, investment, port I don't, portfolio management where you're looking at the technicals and indices and stuff like that is something I don't understand or know anything about. But I approach and, and, and would recommend that anybody really wants to be a good investor is to invest in, in people and invest in companies and learn what they do. Um, and and understand. I mean, when we sit down and talk about um, 
talk about a potential investment, we don't we don't start talking about you know the trends in EPS or the trends in TSR, et cetera. I mean, we obviously get to that. First thing is, what does the company do? What's its mm. market? Mm. Who's its customer? How does it fit in relation to its to its peers? What's the competitive set? Um, so, if you're interested, you know that's the best way to be a good investor, um, and you know, and 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 you know, work for um, an investment management company that has a good reputation for training people, mm -hmm. and then you know. Then once you and then you have to develop a track record to be able to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, another personal question: Do you have any book recommendations, business books or otherwise that that you would give? You know, it's interesting. I don't. You know, um, my favorite book of all time is Pillars of the Earth, which was about building a cathedral in England, and it because it's in my interest in architecture and also just the evolution of, of um, the, the, the medieval world. Um, I, you know, I've never, there aren't a lot of business books that I've found to be, you know, particularly important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I think that, um, I think to be, to be a good investor, you need to have kind of a wide angle lens about the world. So you should read about history and read about, um, you know, things that aren't just how-to things. Mm -hmm. No, which is, again, speaking to the great thing that you Chicago does, right? The sort of liberal exactly. art background combined with then the business stuff sort of at the end. So Exactly. Yeah. So, Peter, we're, we're sort of out of time. I just want to thank you for being willing to come on and being so open and candid with all the questions that came in. Uh, we're delighted at, at U Chicago to have you as an alum, obviously, both the college and Booth, and just incredibly grateful for all that you have done for the college and for Booth going forward. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Right. Great to see thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.